Lindsay McMillan, what's up? Hello, it's so good to see you. Thanks for having me on here. Thank you for coming on. So for the audience who is unaware, Lindsay is a best-selling author, former vice president at Goldman Sachs, very, very competent scholar and athlete, and also just a wonderful human being. Her latest book, The Art of the Deal, was recently listed on the top 100 for Barnes & Noble's best-selling top books. And she's here to share her wisdom about, you know, her experience both on Wall Street in New York headquarters at Goldman Sachs, as well as London, as well as her transition and realizing there's more to life than climbing the corporate ladder and how she's found a, a bit of balance recently with her new role. So thank you so much for, for taking time. I know you're very busy and we appreciate your wisdom. Thank you so much, Dean. It's wonderful to be here and appreciate that very warm intro. It sounded, it sounded in my head, like you said, the art of the deal. And it's the heart of the deal. I always smile at those comparisons because it's the kind of the, the best PR play to have the association of the prior one. It's a little bit I'm different. Extremely it's a embarrassed. Story. I'm extremely embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank awesome. you for, for correcting me. So Lindsay and I were classmates at Dartmouth. We actually shared the same econ class and we went through the recruiting process together. Lindsay, tell, talk me through like how you got interested in finance. Like how did you end up on that path? How, where, like where did you grow up? I know you were a very competent multi-sport athlete, and I wanted to kind of, kind of the audience to know a little bit about your background. Yeah, so I grew up, I'm actually back in my hometown now of Kalamazoo, Michigan. Yes, there really is a Kalamazoo, and then even like kind of a more rural suburb of that. So we literally had a cow farm across from my high school. I was actually the first person from my high school to ever go to Dartmouth. Love my hometown. Most people say Dartmouth or what's that? when they hear it. And I just really wanted to kind of spread my wings, carve my own path. And I had, you know, a very supportive family for that and a ton of opportunities that were available to me. So I kind of felt like, okay, there's no reason not to go and, and dream big here. And, you know, even with the sports analogy, like you mentioned, I never specialize in any sport. So, right, my soccer coaches were like, you need to be playing soccer year round. You know, it's the only sport you can do. You have to give up tennis, you have to give up running, give up lacrosse. And then, you know, my tennis coach was saying the same thing on, on the other side. And I just, I found that not only was it more fun to play more sports, but I was genuinely better at each sport. It was weird when I focused, oh, I did one season where I did only cross country and I wasn't as good as when I was doing cross country and soccer. So I think it's kind of an analogy for, I've always been someone who it's just better and more creative and more vibrant when I have these different sides going. So at Dartmouth, I studied economics, lots of good memories, doing problem sets together in the library, Dean. And I also was doing creative writing and, and English, trying to publish my manuscripts I'd written. So I wouldn't say I was ever kind of on a finance track. I did a finance internship. I took a finance job after graduation because I wasn't breaking in as an author. I thought, okay, I'm going to be around smart people. I'm going to save some money. I'm going to go to New York, see what it's all about. But to me, that was never kind of my life path or life calling. I always knew it would be multifaceted and that writing would be a piece of that. I distinctly remember sophomore summer when you beat me. I think it was me and Bennett. We were playing, what was that ball game? You just completely destroyed us. And then Bennett and I were both kind of college athletes. We're like, there's no way. Let's, let's try this again. Let's actually try our best. And we still got our butts kicked. And I remember you're one of the hardest working students as well. I remember I would I would get started on my problem set and you were like, oh, I'm already done. Or like, I'm 80% done and I'm almost ready for the next assignment. So I, I've always been very impressed with your work ethic, your dedication, how just positive you are overall. And I think it, it was very interesting watching, you know, both of us go from kind of this very, you know, isolated bubble of college into the world of finance, you know, in the biggest city in the world, doing kind of the biggest deals and encountering, you know, Fortune 500 CEOs, et cetera, wearing a suit for the first time and all this stuff. Talk us through that transition. And like, do you have any advice for younger kids who are probably, you know, hearing about investment banking, finance, they want to do it, they want to do an internship. Like what wisdom could you share having gone through the path now? Yeah. And I was actually just back on Dartmouth campus a couple months ago, speaking with students. And I love kind of catching them at that juncture because it was, it's a really brutal transition in a lot of ways. I mean, personally, I felt like Dartmouth was my home. I found my people. I had this beautiful, vibrant group of friends. And I was really sad. I just remember crying so hard on graduation day. I was thinking, oh my gosh, am I ever going to, you know, how can I stay connected with all these wonderful people? And 
Am I just going to be sitting at a desk, you know, toiling away as a cog in the wheel forever? And I think you and I both have always been of the existential variety. And I say that in a positive way, but I really appreciate people and my Dartmouth friends in particular, but like we can, we're kind of have that pick our heads up bigger picture and everything. And honestly, like you and I started at Goldman together and having you there was really kind of a saving grace for my sanity. And just looking around, there were really wonderful things about that experience and the skills that I learned and financial boot camp and all of that. But with that, I had friends I could, you know, pick up dinner with. And then with you, Anna, and me walking back from, you know, Whole Foods or whatever it was, it, working until late at night, but also kind of holding each other accountable on, hey, what are you dreaming about right now? What would you do if you could do anything? Or how can we support each other in like a little thing outside of work that's lighting us up right now? So I think having those people, whether they're naturally baked into your environment in a corporate setting or what have you, or just, you know, making sure that you're really making time for friendships. I think I get on you a bit about that, Dean, because you are such a hard worker. And sometimes you're saying, are you making enough time for your friendships? Because I fully believe that that is what, you know, feeds us and kind of fills our cup. That's amazing. That's amazing. I, I almost forgot about those dinner runs. I, I think part of, part of my mind has, has blocked out a, a portion of it. But the, exactly what you said, I, I mirror a lot of that in college, especially, right? Like if you kind of get a few problems wrong on a problem set, you get like maybe 90, 92 or something, and then you kind of move on, right? Whereas when you go into a professional work environment, like we were in, the only correct answer is like a hundred percent, right? Like there's no iteration of, you know, the memo where, you know, there should be any number that's wrong or any formatting error that's incorrect. And I think that was a big transition for me, but talk me through a little bit, like, I feel like going from kind of this like carefree kid almost in college and then suddenly being in the student high and looking professional, but yet, you know, it takes some time, like you said, to mature and, and, and kind of really grow into that, that role. And, and you, you rose to like very quickly, I think as fast as somebody could through the ranks and becoming a vice president, which is a, a fairly high level role in at Goldman. What did you find really helpful in that maturation process? I remember you were very, very good at communicating professionally holding your tongue when, 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 you know, you just certainly didn't agree with uh, some things that were happening and, and you're much better at that uh, process than I was. What helped you through that? I'll tell you one little anecdote. In the beginning, it felt so uncomfortable. Even seeing myself in a suit, I was like, who is that person in the mirror? You know, I'm just more, I have a bubbly laugh. I'm vibrant. I like colors. I didn't feel like I fit this kind of corporate box. And I was also the only woman on the investing team for a while until Anna came. So I just kind of felt like, okay, I'm so, I just feel so kind of like I don't fit in here. I'm just going to kind of fake it till I make it. So even a little thing, I had this pair of shoes that I kept under my desk. There were these, you know, black pumps, professional heels. I would wear my commuter sneakers to work and then I would put on my heels and I called them my Hollywood shoes. And I guess it was the writer in me always creating characters, but I really created a character for myself where I thought, okay. I am in character now. I am, you know, competent. I'm financially savvy. I know how to play the game. I know how to, you know, just kind of go through the system. And then also, like, I know how to take criticism and not have it hurt me because I'm naturally, you know, a more sensitive person or like if someone's yelling at me about something, it would get to me. So I kind of curated this character where I was able to basically be who I thought I should be. And I'm not recommending that for a long term. I don't think that's how you thrive, but I think it's how you survive. And I felt like I was kind of in survival mode my first year. So I then basically got to a point where I was able to, I kind of got in character enough that then I actually pivoted to the marketing division and then I went to London. And with each of those pivots, I felt like I could bring a little bit more of my real self into the table. And it was kind of, yeah, that process of just saying, okay, how do we give myself kind of a baseline here. And, and like you said, like really focus on understanding, not in a disingenuous way of playing the game, but understand how things operate, like what my objective was. My objective was always to be able to leave and publish books. And I knew certain things had to happen for me to get there. I needed to get a you network. That from the very beginning? Oh yeah, that was always my goal. I mean, I would have done that right out of Dartmouth really? if I'd gotten book deals. I just hadn't, I kept getting rejections. I got hundreds of rejections. I wrote four books that never got published before my first book. And no now my way. second book is coming no out. In way. Yeah. 
I remember yeah. because you, you would be sitting on a third floor barrier and you just have these like manuscripts written and then <laughs> you would have already the econ problem said done and then the manuscript is in the process and I'm like just starting. I'm like, oh wait, <laughs> you're like, I'm ready when, you know, working on this chapter of this book. So it's always been a passion of yours, like something that's like, it's like you can't help but do, right? It's almost like, it's just like, it's like pouring out of you and you, it just needs to be expressed on the page as opposed to like something that you discipline yourself to do. It's both. Like I think- Sorry, go ahead. Sometimes we say, oh, we're following a passion. Like then there's the perception that you're not, you don't need discipline. Discipline is what makes your dreams come true. But yeah, writing and creating for me is kind of the one thing I can't not do. Like you said, so I would be literally working on an LBO model at the desk. And then I'd have this line come in my head and I would frantically have to scribble it in my notebook, you know, before it gets away. And it was bubbling out of me. And that's kind of how I always knew that it was something I couldn't let die. There would have been many moments I could have given up on that publishing dream or just said, you know, oh, I have a good job now. I, I'm a believer that if your plan B is too good, you won't, don't reach your plan A. And that haunted me for a while. So I was like, I'm, I can even especially once I started, you know, liking my experience at Goldman more and being more comfortable with all of that. It was like, I could stay here and have a good, fine career but I would be haunted by never knowing, you know, that my plan A, you know, I hadn't fully gone for that. So yeah, I was always, you know, writing on the side. I would wake up before five in the morning and write for two or three hours before work pretty much every day. And that's discipline. I'm not saying every day. I wasn't like rolling out of bed. No way. Can't wait to write. That would happen sometimes, but mostly it stays when you're like, oh, okay. I know I need to do this because this is my goal and this is my dream and this is going to pay off. But it's hard, especially in the middle years where I had years of not getting a break and not feeling like there was any guarantee that all this time and energy was going to be paying off. But like you said, I think even at Dartmouth, I I printed out manuscripts and I just had a box of all my books even before they saw the light of day at Barnes and Noble or whatnot. And that was that gave me a certain peace because I knew I was creating and I knew I was creating something original. I was the only person who could have written those books. I, you know, had some unique gift that I feel like, you know, personally, I feel like God has given me this creative gift and I can shine light in the world how I can. And that's kind of always been the framework with which I've approached the writing. But there are many days when it's not fun. It's not glamorous. And that's where just the discipline comes into play. I've never been, I'm not a natural genius like you. Like I've always had to start, you are a genius. I had to start my problem sets, like you said, like weeks early and be much more disciplined about that just so I can honestly hold my own at an Ivy League school. So in in a way that really helped me then just carve out time for my writing as well. That's amazing. That's amazing. I can't believe like on top of the job itself, which was grueling and demanding, you're waking up two hours early just to write. And, and even on days you don't feel like writing, I respect that so much. And I remember you were also like very disciplined in working out too. Like you would run or bike to the office, with it, which I think is just incredible. What was the guiding kind of like compass, I guess, for you? Knowing, like you said, there's so much uncertainty. There's so much negativity if you let it get to you. The hours are grueling. You, may, you might not be sleeping that much. How did you know that this would happen? Or you didn't know. And you're just like, I don't care. Like, even if it doesn't work, I am going to do this because I love it. Or, or what was like, how did you battled. I'm sure there were times when, you know, you wonder like, is this possible at all? And am I wasting my time? Like how, how did you persevere? A great mama that I could call on the phone and who she would talk me through my breakdowns, great friendships. But then, yeah, like you said, kind of like still trying to feed my soul and I'm big on the kind of energy and even like the energy I feel after I work out, I have more energy, the energy I feel after I write. I have more energy, right? So even though we're expending energy on those activities, it's a net positive. And so I think that that's kind of the guiding framework or principle that really sets us on the right track. Like I think our intuition is such a strong um, undertapped vehicle for us. And deep down, we kind of know like why we're here, what we're kind of our purposes in the short time on earth. So I think just listening to my body on that and understanding, even with friends, like, right, who do I kind of spend time with and I feel recharged after? And then who do I feel like, oh my gosh, I just feel drained or overwhelmed or I'm just spiraling now. 
I mean, right? There are all those little cues. And I think the standard corporate environment tells us to not listen to our body, not listen to those smaller cues, the energy in a room, all of that, because we're kind of just like head down. You have to go. You have to close the deal. And I credit, pe- you know, people like you who are asking those tougher, bigger philosophical questions and challenging me to, you know, to also be be having those thoughts. So. I mean, I mean, those those thoughts are, are not conducive for staying in a corporate role for a very long time. So I'm sorry uh, for sharing those. So talk us through kind of how your, you know, amazing bestselling book came about, like the heart of the deal. It basically talks about, and I, I read through it, and my, I've also bought copies for both my parents. They're big okay. fans. And then my, I think my dad <laughs> independently bought a couple of copies for his friends. It basically chron- chronicles, you know, young woman in New York working in a finance role. So very similar to kind of what we went through, the ups and downs, the social, you know, balancing the social life with, you know, the uh, societal expectations and career prospects, et cetera. Talk, talk me through that story how it came about what your process was did you do it like chronologically like as you went or was it like as these kind of chapters came in you kind of slotted them in like what is the the process through which that that book comes comes together yeah i know some people are like lindsay did you write a memoir are you sure this is fiction right because like you said (laughs) as a young woman working on wall street navigating friendships and dating and feel she's a, a creative soul who feels a bit trapped in a corporate box. So yes, I very much kind of use real life as inspiration. But for me, the truly fun, liberating part of writing comes from the fiction angle. And I can play with alternative realities. I can stretch things beyond what they were in real life. I can replay and, you know, change endings, change events. Like I have really the power that I wield as the author. And then I kind of get to know these characters and I almost feel like they're pulling me around. So I actually write, I'm a big believer in, and I think why I knock on wood so far, I haven't had long bouts of writer's block, but I just kind of like vomit onto the page. I get that first draft out there. And I actually, with the heart of the deal, I wrote the whole first draft. I really was just trying to figure out who these characters are, what they're fighting for. That first draft looks literally nothing like the end manuscript in terms of what happens, really even who the characters are a lot. but. It gives me something that out there I'm invested in it. And then I'm a lot more inclined to go back and revise it and do, you know, the subsequent 10, 15 drafts to actually make it good. But I feel like, yeah, it's kind of like that letting yourself just go on the first draft and not trying to control the experience and then really using all of the more, again, the discipline and the revision. I think of it in three main stages. One is the exploration. That's like the first draft, maybe the second one. Two is the execution. So slowly building it up chapter by chapter, making sure it's standing on good ground. And three is the elevation. So just polishing it up, making the word choice sound pretty. I put a lot of effort into kind of writing poetic prose. So I care a lot about my word choice. And that's kind of the final polish. So that's how it That one really went. It was about over a year and a half that I wrote it. You know, my friends and I were single in New York. We were on the dating apps. We had so much material. It was kind of just, it would have been a shame not to write a book inspired by that. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's very, very interesting. There were definitely a a lot of parallels to just kind of seeing the the mirrors about the late night work emails, the things, you know, (laughs) the passive aggressive messages you sometimes just see from coworkers. That's like, wow, okay, this person definitely live through that lifestyle and and know is kind of what it's about. I just want to jump in on one more point on that because you also, it also gave me more gratitude for my job at Goldman Sachs for being in finance in a couple of ways. One, I realized so many authors have a hard time paying the bills and I had a job that let me do that. And two, I was able to experience this slice of the world that other people weren't writing about in a creative fiction love story way because they weren't in it. And you just realize, you know, that that was such an immense gift that I was able to write a book that really stood out to people, resonated with all of these women in corporate America, men too, who have felt like they are not really represented in fiction, right? We have all the business books, the lean in and all those wonderful ones, but we don't really see ourselves in kind of these contemporary fiction settings. So that also is like, okay, I'm I'm collecting stories here, right? <laughs> And exactly like like you said, personally, one of the reasons why I was so interested in working 
on Wall Street's Beast. I was curious. I was like, I, I've seen movies, right? I've watched from Arjun Call, The Big Short. I want to know what it's actually like, like in behind those rooms, talking to those people, negotiating those deals. And I'm really grateful for those opportunities, even though there were a lot of tough times, you know, long hours. But I think it's, it's a really good experience just for life in general. So talk, talk us through a little bit about the business side of being an author. Like you said, there's the passion and the creativity and kind of the artist side of it. But the, also there's publishing books is a business. And, and I know you went through your own journey just getting it a publishing deal in the first place and then, you know, doing a lot of the promotion and everything. Talk us through, especially for people looking to follow your path your journey and also kind of things that you would maybe look out for or things that you would do differently if you were to do it again. It's really interesting because when I was kind of sitting at the desk that when you and I were both at Goldman on the investing side, right, we would put together the inv these investment memos, take it to our investment committee, and they would vote if we should, you know, invest in the deal or not. And I was realizing, wait a second, there are so many parallels kind of between even entrepreneurs pitching investors and then authors pitching agents and publishers, right? You have to boil your whole book down to essentially a one-page query letter, which is kind of the synopsis marketing sheet. You find an agent who's aligned and represents your genre. You have to then get a publisher to be bought in. You have to go through all the negotiations. Like there are so many practical business steps. And what I felt like Dartmouth, I, you know, love that place more than anything in the world. And I got to be such a better writer through the many, many workshops and classes and independent studies and creative writing thesis I did there. The big gap was they didn't teach us anything about the business side of things. They, you know, I, I kept asking my professors, like, how do I get published if, you know, and their agents had either retired or they didn't know about the market nowadays. But there's almost the feeling that, oh, thinking about the commercial side of it, the business side, oh, don't don't go there. That taints the art. We're just going to like learn the craft and hone the craft. And if you're focused on money, oh, no, that's not what writers, that's not what artists do, honey. Like it was a little bit like that. And I was kind of like, hey, I, I don't want to be a starving artist. Like I want to make a career out of this and, you know, eat some nice meals along the way. And so I kind of thought, let me, again, back to like realizing in hindsight, kind of the gift of starting in the corporate path, like that was 100% the right place for me at the time, because I had gained a great network of people who actually then sponsored a lot of events for my book launch. They chipped in, they helped kind of consult me for different brand partnerships and stuff. And I really kind of, I guess, dubbed this term authorpreneurship where I was really bringing this book to launch as a product launch and, you know, thinking about, yeah, just really innovative ways to shake up the traditional book tour with having these female founded brands sponsor me for my book launches, for going into entrepreneurial communities of women, even corporate book clubs, all these different avenues that wouldn't have been open to me if I hadn't realized, if I hadn't kind of just gotten that finance and even marketing foundation that I got at Goldman. So I'm really passionate now. I'm actually teaching a course this winter about the art and business side of writing a book because both are so important. Like you don't want to just a garbage book that then you market well and you are good, great at the business and then you, you know, have it out there, but you're not really proud of the book itself. And that, that does happen. And then on the flip side, you could have these beautiful books that never see the light of day or they just completely flop or they don't even get a book deal because there's a, a lack of that business acumen. So I recognize kind of the privilege I've had by getting those business experiences. And a lot of authors traditionally tend to be a little bit more introverted or a little bit, a lot of them are a little scared to kind of go to the words business and that kind of language is a bit daunting. So to kind of be a part of helping that education curve and bring Ultimately, I see it as bringing power back to the authors because then we have more control and say and power in our in the work that we actually create. So the business side is it's huge. So talk us through a little bit. Because I, I'm curious as well. I've I've never been on a book tour. What is a book tour? When people say that, what does it mean to have brands sponsor you? Like, what do those things actually mean? Yeah. So I mean, publishers don't do much. <laughs> That's no secret. <laughs> So it's kind of really a lot on on authors. And I thought, OK, yeah, I'm going to really shake this up and do something modern. I just pitched on my own. I came up with my little 
pitch deck and I pitched women founded companies that were aligned as far as who their audience was and who my audience was. So my book is for men and women. The core target is probably women 20 to 45. And I had a couple of really big events where I said, okay, there are going to be, you know, 150 people here. Here's the demographic. Do you want to even, you know, set up a table? I'll give you the mic for two minutes. And just really got scrappy about it. When I told my publisher what I was doing, they're kind of like, oh, like, what's that? <laughs> like, what you're doing? What? Yes. <laughs> and, you know, they were supportive, but they weren't funding that. They weren't going to come up with those ideas. And, you know, and also the Dartmouth Entrepreneurial Network sponsored another event. Greg Lemka, who, you know, was a Dartmouth trustee and former head of investment banking at Goldman Sachs. These really great business people kind of came around me and really helped me kind of stand on their shoulders. And that to me had so much of a, and, and from the sales data too, so much of a higher ROI than just going to your local bookstore or Barnes & Noble. I did, I did some of those events, but it's hard to get people to just kind of show up and come to a bookstore. Like I, my philosophy was really meeting people where they are, especially because of my first book I was trying to break in. So I was really trying to like go out and kind of get these big convening, fun, you know, rooftop New York party, which isn't really what you think of as a old fashioned, very quiet, bookstore event. So it, it was a lot of like kind of do, doing a lot, seeing what sticks, iterating for my next go around this spring. So that's amazing. That's amazing. And and I know you also have a very popular Instagram where you post poetry, at, at least if, if memory serves. And it has a massive following. I think tens of thousands, at least at last I checked. How, how did that come about? And then like, has that helped in your kind of book tour and, and kind of promoting the, the book or, or how do you see social media now in addition, obviously, physical events and, and get togethers? I think I'm a big believer that when I feel stuck, the, the sensation of feeling stuck breeds creativity and it breeds thinking outside the box and finding another way. So like I said, I was writing these books. I was trying to get seen by agents and I was feeling stuck. And one of the pieces of feedback, you know, pre getting an agent, pre book deal was that I didn't really have you know, a digital platform. Platform is the word. And basically that means publishers now want to see their margins are so low. Their, their business model is very interesting. And so they really need you to sell it yourself. And if they don't trust that you can sell your book yourself, no matter how good the book is, they're not going to take a chance on you. It's very risk averse. Whereas that's why I say, I think Silicon Valley, I think startup life is what you're doing is so much more just genuinely creative than the publishing industry. The industry is not creative at all. You have to say it's X meets Y. This book has sold X number of copies and mine is exactly like this. So you can feel safe with it or you need to, you know, have a built in following. So mine, you know, isn't massive enough that I can just sell my books all through there. But I was able to gain traction and kind of prove out, OK, proof of concept a little bit. Right. Like what I'm writing is fresh and innovative and kind of this poetry prose format where I would just take little slices of my day and put it on there. And it was kind of just an experiment and it really struck a chord. I don't think it was the deciding factor for getting an agent or a book deal, but it certainly didn't hurt. It doesn't sell books as much. It's more for the awareness and the feeling like you're seeing things out there. But social media generally is a lower conversion, you know, on the whole for selling books, but it's great for brand awareness and for partnering. I partner with a lot of bookstagrammers, book talkers, and they all post about it. They all read it. So yeah, again, it kind of just gets that feeling right with the spheres of influence and persuasion. I think you need to see something seven times before you buy it or do it. So it, it's really very helpful and kind of a top of the funnel, but it's not, I have an interesting relationship with it because I in an ideal world, I would not be on social media at all. <laughs> and I actually go through dark. I've been pretty dark now on it because I've been deep in getting my next book. And I feel like the content of having a full book versus all of the noise and distractions that come with the little bite-sized thing of social media doesn't feel great. So I'm honestly still trying to kind of figure out where that fits in everything. But it's a little bit of a necessary evil to get started. Yeah, totally, totally. Amazing that you have that self-awareness to know when when something is serving you, even if it's giving you a lot of dopamine or other 
kind of short-term positive feedback and then knowing that, you know, I need to, you know, cut that off for now and kind of work on, on creating. So one of the themes I think that, that uh, is in the heart of the deal. And I think a lot of uh, young professional women deal with is obviously the concept of like, how do you balance having potentially, you know, a significant other and a child and, and balancing that with career. And obviously the big number 30, which I think is, is kind of pressing on a lot of people's minds. How have you found that balance? Because I think you've done a great job of it. And also like what advice could you give for kind of college age young professionals who will probably deal with a lot of these same questions that, you know, your main character in the book deals with, obviously you've dealt with personally. How have you found that, that kind of work-life synergy? And I'd love to hear about, you know, the new role that you took on recently that, you know, employs more of your, your finance skill set. And, you know, I, I think you have a be very beautiful mosaic of a life and kind of a good balance of all these pieces. So I, I'd love to, for our audience to hear about it. Well, the first chapter of the book is called Quarter Life Crisis. And yeah, the, she, the character Ray is 25 at the time, 25th birthday, nothing like, you know, that for a good existential spiral. And she starts mapping out her life in that very analytical investment bankery way of saying, I want to have three kids and, you know, before 35. And then she really backtracks and realizes, oh, no, I need to meet someone tomorrow. And she gets in her head. And a lot of the book is kind of ultimately debunking those pressures, right? Those internal pressures we feel, the societal pressures that there are certain timelines or deadlines for us. Because I, I think that that really, that stress spiral does not serve us. It is not ultimately helping us be on a path that is fulfilling. It's a recipe for following in other people's footsteps and just going along because it's what we should do. So it's interesting, like this might sound like a weird writer thing to say, but I really learned from my character, Ray, as I was writing through her. So I'm 29 now. The book came out when I was 28, but I finished it a little before that. So she overtook me in age as I was writing it. And I was starting to kind of approach 30 in her world and she turned 30. And now I feel like, oh, I've already done that. You know, <laughs> like I'm, I've already kind of gone through all of those considerations and Still have a lot to learn, of course, but she really genuinely inspired me in that she, you know, not too much of a spoiler, but ha doesn't have a clear partner at 30 at the end of the book. She's single and she's really feeling like that's a new beginning for her. And, you know, I, I've been in a relationship for three years. I'm really grateful for, for that and for making time, even with all of the other chaos going on. And I think, you know, no matter where you are, relationship or single, just knowing that there's not one right way to do things and you're not kind of going to close a door. I even felt it with writing, right? Like, oh, I need to publish while I'm in my 20s because I'm going to get more attention or press. And like, why do we put all this pressure on ourselves, right? I love hearing stories of my grandfather passed away last year, but he was still learning Italian and taking classes in, in tech at the local library. And like, we can just do so many more things down the line. But I will say kind of I don't think that we're ever going to feel like we've arrived. I'm surrounded by a lot of wonderfully successful friends, you included. And I think that sometimes there's a the temptation of saying, oh, I'm going to wait to invest in my relationships and my friendships until I'm more established in my career or until I've arrived or whatever it is. Women, we have our biological clocks. That's just a real thing to think about. Men sometimes feel, on average, a little bit more maybe like you need to be financially able to provide or anything kind of like traditionally old fashioned minded. And I think it's kind of, yeah, how do we just kind of dismantle and then reconstruct just what really is an authentic path for us? What is lighting us up and what is serving other people around us? Like we talk about like, oh, what serves me? Like, how are we serving the world? And that truly is going to be a guiding, a guiding light for us. So I think as long as we're kind of staying really in tune with those things. We should just try not to freak out about it too much, but I certainly don't have the answers. And I think that's what I wanted the book to come across too, is like, I'm still not, I'm by no means an expert on this. This is just something, let's have a dialogue. Let's talk about how we're all feeling a little bit this way right now. And that's okay to feel like this. It's okay to feel overwhelmed and lost. And you're certainly not alone in that. So I think that's kind of the biggest message. Like I want everyone to feel big feelings. If if that's what they're feeling, I'm very much a high, high, low, low person. And I fought that for many years and trying to just like stabilize and find that middle. But that's not 
me. And a lot of my magic and creative power comes from, you know, the delta between the two. So I think when we still try to like care for ourselves through it all, it can actually be channeled positively. So talk me through about this this new role. Congratulations on the new role. I, yeah. I remember we had talked briefly as you were contemplating it. And I, I love how you're tying basically your skill set and also your, your message for how to bring back to your community and, and empower kind of individuals. So I'd love to hear, hear more about it. And, and I know the audience would be very interested as well. As well. Yeah, so I recently started a part-time role as head of community for a private equity firm back in my hometown of Kalamazoo. And specifically, I'm focused on helping them reach their target of having 50% women CEOs in their portfolio companies. So I just kind of was trying to network. I was doing full-time authorpreneurship around the book launch. I had left Goldman. I was working in London. I moved back with my mom here in Kalamazoo and honestly kind of feeling like, okay, I'm so happy I have more time to write. And also I, I miss a little bit of that energy, right? Like everything has good and bad. And I was just kind of thinking, how do I expand, at least expand my network here in Michigan and meet more people in business who are building interesting things? So I connected with the co-founders of Sleeping Giant Capital here in Kalamazoo and just loved what they were doing. And it's growing fast. It's newer. And specifically, you know, the the way to support investment in Michigan businesses, which is their mandate, and have that ambitious 50% women target, hopefully diversity really across all metrics. And I realized like, as I, you know, work there a few days a week, and I do my writing stuff, and I am not drawing from this fixed sum of creativity, right? I think the thesis is kind of in the beginning, you think, oh, when I have more time to write, I'm going to write more and I'm going to write better. But because I had gotten so in the habit of having that discipline with my years at Goldman and having really deep work concentrated two or three hour blocks of time and making good progress, I actually found the whole days of stretching out before me in some ways, you know, had a diminishing marginal utility, if it were, you know, from the writing standpoint. So I really feel like the feeling is lifted. I get more inspired when I'm out and about meeting people in the community feeling like I'm working on a mission I believe in, keeping my finance acumen and language, you know, really sharp, learning something new. I think that it lifts up my writing, even if I'm not writing about that stuff. It certainly inspires me creatively and just kind of back to that being a weird, well-rounded people that we all are. But it's it's about the balance for me. But I also knew I told them, you know, no, my writing is not just a hobby. It's a career as well. Right. So I need to allocate the time and the energy to that. So they've been super wonderful about being flexible and really job crafting this role for me to have it be this balance. So I'm not just thrown back into the, you know, investment banking world 24 seven, because I worked too hard to get where I am to then have that kind of freedom and flexibility taken away. Yeah. Yeah. Totally, totally. What were the main differences you noticed between New York and London? I actually never worked in London. I've been there, obviously, for, for periods of uh, business trips. But what were the main differences? Did you like it more or less? I'm genuinely curious for my own personal interest. I loved London. My family actually lived there for three years when I was really small. And it, it just, I always wet my appetite for it. I wanted to go back. I wanted to live in London. So it was the pandemic. I had kind of been asking Goldman for opportunities for a while, but I basically made something happen and I jumped on it because they were sponsoring my visa. And I just thought, okay, now is the time. It might not make sense to go in the middle of a pandemic. I went in, I guess, early 2021. I didn't know a single person there and I loved it. Like I, ideally, I probably, you know, would have stayed a bit longer, but then with the book stuff, it made sense. It was publishing in the U.S. first, so I came back and did fully, you know, immersed there as I wanted to be. But I love London. It's a little bit of a quieter city than New York. So waking up in the mornings and like a little thing like the coffee shops don't open until seven, a lot of them. So I was like, how am I going to do my writings? There's a there's a really nice kind of calm that comes with that, too. Like you're not sometimes New York gets so overpowering right that can be a little bit draining so there's more green space there's more just kind of mellow energy people taking their vacation days and I I loved exploring making friends there traveling so 
I highly recommend an abroad experience because I think you just grow so much as a person. <laughs> I, I love that you, you got to study abroad program while working at Goldman. That's amazing. That's how I looked at um, it. I was ultimately at Goldman six years in three divisions and two countries. So I really created that back to like the Renaissance person model, but just creating as well-rounded of an experience as I could. That's just more fun for me. That's amazing. That's, amazing. that's, that's how I stayed so Lindsay, long. Talk to, me, talk to me about fear. Because I feel like a lot of people have similar dreams or as big dreams as you do, but fear holds them back from it. And it sounds like from your life path, you have very little of it, or you somehow have found a way to overcome it. What is your process with fear? Well, first of all, I mean, I'm very aware that my success is not my success alone, right? Like Mal Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, does a very good job of sharing that. Any individual success is really built on so much opportunity and privilege and community, family support, all of that. So I certainly had a lot of that. And I'm not trying to say like, you know, I've just achieved this on my own or I'm just fearless on my own, right? I had, I've never had to genuinely fear at all for my basic needs. So that just moves us farther up the Maslow hierarchy of needs, I think about it, right? So when you have your shelter and your food, safety, security met, then you can actually kind of reckon with this self-actualization at the top tier of the pyramid. And I think for me, that's really where a lot of my fear. I've had the privilege to have my fear exist in that sphere of things where I say, okay, what if I get to the end of my life and I don't feel like I've lived up to my potential or I haven't created what I'm supposed to create or made the world better or touched people's hearts? Those are the questions that have kept me up at night, honestly, since I was a, a little kid. <laughs> you know, the quest, my mom keeps a cool journal when I was, you know, four or five years old asking these these questions. So it's very consistent. I think that we spend too much time trying to fight fear or trying to control our experience or even label it as a bad thing. Fear means that you're putting yourself out there in some in some way, shape, or form. It can be channeled into a really positive growth experience. Like with launching my book and having people love it and hate it and write wonderful things and write nasty things and do a TED talk where I'm in front of a whole audience. I was a shy little kid and I'm naturally an introvert. I have fear in those moments. And yet I, I think it's kind of coming back to your why. Like what's the why of why you're doing it? For me, it's I feel like, yeah, I want to share this light in the world through my words, through the words that are written, through the words that I speak aloud. And that's bigger than all of us. And it's this kind of liberating feeling of, okay, I'm actually not really going to mess it all up because I'm not even in control of it in the first place. And some of it comes down to also just getting the reps of rejection, right? I mean, it's the same for relationships. There are parallels. But if I hadn't gotten my years of rejections from agents and publishers and other rejections in other forms along, you know, along my life, I wouldn't have had to done the work to detach my identity from those things, right? For a while, I thought... My identity is my writing. I, this is my heart and soul. I said it was my soul. It's not, right? Like it is one expression, but it is not me. And so that has this really nice kind of, you're able to stay safe and that does mitigate some fear, even though it's still out there. You know that your core identity is not shaken. And, you know, whether that is just your three closest relationships in your life, your relationship with God, your relationships with just those things that really ground you. Because I think in the absence of that, we're so susceptible to fear that we just let it kind of control our life and honestly, like not, not let us take risks, which I think is a big waste. Totally, totally. I forgot to, I, I don't know if I remembered to mention in the intro, but you're also a TEDx speaker. I remember when you, you DM'd me, like, this might be happening. And it'll be super, how did that come about? And also like, how long did you prep for it? Were you feeling like, butterflies while you're going on stage knowing that that's like going to be on the internet forever like what was the what that experience like yeah I mean it's so interesting right because for so many years I was like I want to publish a book a book a book and then my friend in London basically nominated me for a TED talk I found out the next day I got it I had two weeks to prep for it it was so fast and so out of left field that I just felt like I felt this tingly experience of oh my gosh, this is a gift. It can only really help me, right? And having this experience and also kind of in the content itself and the 
PR and marketing value of such a thing. It certainly helped me monetize a lot more of my speaking events afterwards related to my book and my story and all of that. But yeah, it was scary. I mean, I I had no clue what I was doing. I just ordered the how to do a TED Talk book on Amazon and, you know, you, you order the book. Yeah, <laughs> I did. They didn't give me a coach or anything. So I just like, OK, here we go. And <laughs> I was nervous. And but it also gave me energy. Right. So back to doing those things that I felt actually so energized by that I wasn't depleted. But, yeah, it was out of my comfort zone. And I think if I do another one, it's just like I'm a little bit more comfortable for that. And then another one. So it's back to just kind of we can do scary things and we can feel really grateful for that. Because what a, what an incredible opportunity to even have have the ability to feel fear for such a thing like that. So yeah, that's a, that that was amazing. So anybody who's interested, just Google her her name, Lindsay McMillan, Heart of the Deal TEDx talk, and I think it should be the first result. I watched it; it was flawless. I thought from my perspective, I didn't see a single. I didn't have teleprompter uh, you know, or anything, so I was just I had I what really yeah no I was so scared I was going to like just trip up on something and not know where I was because I saw it, I, I knew it all in my head but then I needed to be present so that was the hardest part yeah but thank you it's between like modern dating being like modern deal making so again the two sides of my world of finance and romance kind of colliding themes of the book and my experiences so I appreciate that that's amazing that's amazing and I know you have a sequel coming up could you tell us a little bit about that or it's, it's not not revealed yet yeah, I was actually hoping. So the books should be arriving. They're called ARCs, Advanced Reader Copies. My agent got them yesterday and sent me a photo. So I think mine will be arriving any day. It's not a sequel, actually, but it is a similar genre of, I, I see the central thread as women who are redefining success in their relationships, in their careers, figuring life out in your 20s and 30s. So this next one is set in London. Again, collecting stories. <laughs> she's not an investment banker. She's a consultant. So consultant satire coming your way. But she has in her head, you know, that she wants to be partner. And she's destined for the C-suite. And then similarly, she wants to fall in love with her, you know, handsome English prince and has these big lofty dreams. It's called Double Decker Dreams. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? This is Dean. Thank you so much for paying attention to the podcast up until this point. Apologies for the interruption, but we had some technical difficulties. So the ending of this podcast got cut short. But thank you so much, Lindsay, for joining us. If you would be interested in potentially meeting Lindsay at one of her meetups or reading one of her books, we have links to that in the description below. I hope you enjoyed this episode and we will see you on the next one. Please, if you want to support this channel, uh, leave us a like, comment and subscribe below. And uh, take care. We hope you're doing well.